The Grand Alliance of America and France had proven victorious over the British by 1781, and the long, wearying Revolutionary War drew to a close. The victory at Yorktown was the capstone to the war. With Cornwallis's surrender, the British had no choice but to admit defeat. The British Empire suffered defeats around the world, and the government of Lord North fell. Bled dry of men and resources, and still not completely recovered from the strain of the French and Indian War, the Crown was in no condition to continue the struggle. Peace became the goal of the new government of Lord Rockingham, and with the support of Parliament, overtures were made to the Americans. They were quickly accepted, and an American peace delegation set off for Europe to discuss terms. The break with America and Britain was now final and absolute. The Treaty of Paris, signed in 1783, officially ended the war. The terms won by the American negotiators were extremely satisfactory. First of all, independence and status as a sovereign state was granted to the former colonies, and a new nation was formed. But the Americans made other gains as well. Fishing rights in the North Atlantic were granted then, an important consideration, especially in New England. Also, the vast lands of the Northwest Territory of Ohio and Illinois fell into the new American domain, providing the 13 states with land into which to grow and expand. The victory was a full one. But now, the Patriots had to decide on a system of government under which they could rule themselves. They soon embarked on a voyage of experimentation, which would ultimately yield the Constitution of the United States. The revolution was over and won. A time of peace began, and American thoughts turned from war to hopes of prosperity. A new nation entered the world community, a republic in a world still dominated by kings, and the world watched the American experiment in liberty begin. The Continental Congress, defined by the Articles of Confederation, was the central government of the United States. But keeping with the spirit of local self-rule, the Congress was weak. The Continental Army was disbanded. With no war, there was no need for expensive troops. Besides, the states, remembering the British Army, were fearful of centrally controlled, large-standing armies. George Washington bade his officers farewell and retired to the peace of Mount Vernon. Many patriots dropped out of public life, eager to resume the private lives they were forced to quit nearly ten years earlier. Fresh faces appeared, and a new era in American history began. Initially, all was prosperous. Industry, commerce, and agriculture all grew, though the population dropped as a result of vast numbers of Tories emigrating overseas. The West opened up for a new wave of settlement. Thomas Jefferson drew up a rough plan for the organization of this new territory, a plan later to become the basis of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. The same Thomas Jefferson was also working on his Statutes of Religious Freedom and was writing a body of philosophical material that would reflect the thinking of the times. Western settlement became so extensive that some of the inhabitants of the area bonded together and formed a new state called Franklin, which remained an unofficial existence for nearly five years. Expansion, prosperity, independence, the goals of the revolution seemed won. However, the dream quickly ended as Americans began to experience the painful realities of self-government. Local rule reflected local interests and rivalries. The union of 13 states was more a very loose association of independent nations than a single country. No consistent policies could be enacted by the weak Congress for the nation as a whole. Congress was almost a government in name only. It lacked real power 
and most of its laws were not binding on the states and could be ignored. Congress could not tax, for example, and had to request money from the states. Between 1781 and 1784, it requested over seven million dollars, but received only one and one-half million. An efficient military organization was also excluded from congressional control, and each state relied on its own often untrained and inadequate militia to meet defensive needs. Superintendent of Finance Robert Morris and Secretary of Foreign Affairs John Jay headed up loose committees that constituted a generally ineffective national executive. Soon this government of non-government found itself in political and economic chaos. Foreign trade, the backbone of American prosperity, soon fell into a shambles due to a lack of national leadership. Congress could not regulate commerce and could not gain vital foreign trade concessions. Each state had its own trade policy. Trade began to fall off, as did industry and agriculture. Foreign affairs, too, became chaotic as the young nation fell victim to foreign powers. The dread Barbary pirates began to raid American merchant ships in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. With no navy, the U.S. ships were powerless prey. The lack of British naval protection was keenly felt. On the Mississippi River, the Americans were denied the right to navigate by the Spanish and were denied access to the Spanish-held port of New Orleans a threat to the transport of three-eighths of the nation's produce. But there was no American army to force concessions and no strong government to negotiate them. Conflict with Great Britain was renewed by 1786. Congress, lacking tax powers, could not pay its war debts. So the British refused to leave the Great Lakes area in accordance with the Treaty of Paris. The British presence became a grave threat to Western expansion. Moreover, Indian tribes, sensing U.S. weakness and tacitly encouraged by the British, began a series of bloody frontier wars. Eventually, a treaty was signed with the Barbary pirates, but it too involved raising money to pay the pirates a humiliating tribute. And again, Congress lacked the means to raise funds. And even with payment, the piracies continued. A general depression began as a result of all these problems, and the new nation, less than half a decade old, was on the brink of complete collapse. Markets vanished, commerce and industry failed, farm prices plummeted, imports and exports dropped. Money was worthless. Investors were wiped out in overspeculation. States began issuing worthless paper money to provide needed capital, but this led to inflation and only worsened the situation. Finally, in 1786, the British Navy closed the West Indies to American trade, removing America's last major market. Observers, seeing that the root of the nation's problems was its inefficient government, began calling for reform. Widespread crises spurred on these calls. In 1786, James Madison, a Virginia lawyer, called for a convention in Annapolis, Maryland, to revise the Articles of Confederation. However, only a few states attended, and little was accomplished other than that Madison gained valuable ideas on how to reform the government. Alexander Hamilton, a brilliant New Yorker, allied himself with Madison and called for a larger convention to be held a year later in Philadelphia. Hamilton counted on an increasing desperation to spur attendance, and that desperation materialized. Shays' Rebellion broke out in western Massachusetts as farmers, angered by the state's fiscal and tax policy, openly defied authority. The state militia was barely able to handle the crisis, and the central government was unable to help. The fear caused by Shays' rebellion made business and commerce even worse. And in 1787, sobered men rushed to Philadelphia to attend the convention. The Philadelphia Convention opened on May 25, 1787, and was designed originally 
to revise the Articles of Confederation. But under Madison's subtle guidance, it quickly concerned itself not with revision, but with the creation of a new form of government. It became a constitutional convention. George Washington, America's premier symbol of unity, was elected president of the convention, while a host of dignitaries, such as Benjamin Franklin, Madison, Hamilton, Edmund Randolph, Gouverneur Morris, Roger Sherman, and George Mason represented every state except Rhode Island. A plan for a new federal system with a responsible executive, a workable judiciary, a legislature, and a means of guaranteeing the rights of the states was the goal of the assembly. The debate was joined over the matter of representation in the all-important legislature. The Virginia plan, calling for representation to be based on population, was proposed by Edmund Randolph. Such a system would favor large states with large populations. Understandably, the small states were opposed to this plan. Advocates of small states like William Livingston and George Reed introduced the New Jersey plan, whereby each state would receive one vote in the legislature. This plan was found unsuitable by the large states. Finally, a compromise was reached. Introduced by Roger Sherman and devised by Benjamin Franklin, the compromise called for a Senate where each state would be equally represented and a House of Representatives where representation would be based on population. Thus, through debate and through many shrewd compromises, the Constitution was drafted and submitted to the Convention for approval on September 6th. A few more details were ironed out, and when the Convention adjourned on September 16th, the document that would rule America for two centuries was completed. It created a federal government consisting of three branches, an executive run by a president, a two-house legislature, and a judiciary of a Supreme Court and a federal court system. It was understood that George Washington would be the first president, and the president was granted very definite powers. He was commander-in-chief of the armed forces. He could grant reprieves and pardons. He could, with the advice and consent of the Senate, make treaties, appoint ambassadors, judges, and other governmental officials. The implementation of law was the president's primary function, and by his veto power, he also had a say in the legislative process. Congress would hold all legislative powers. It could raise and levy taxes, raise and support armies, pay debts, regulate currency, regulate commerce, establish post offices, declare war, suppress insurrections, repel invasions, and make laws necessary to carry out its duties. The Constitution also prohibited the federal government from doing certain things, such as showing favoritism in the implementation of law. The power of the states, too, was upheld. Aware that many Americans resented a strong central government, the framers clearly spelled out the extent of the federal power. All powers not given to the federal government were given to the states, thus ensuring a strong system of local government. The abuse of power was one of the Constitution's major concerns, and many of its stipulations deal with a system of checks and balances designed so that no single branch of government could gain absolute control. When a draft of the Constitution was submitted to the 13 states for ratification, the framers felt that they had devised a practical alternative to the Articles of Confederation. Now it was up to each state to agree with them. Nine states had to ratify the Constitution for it to become law. The ensuing debate between Federalists, those who supported the Constitution, and Anti-Federalists, those who were opposed, was often bitter. But by January of 1788, Five states had ratified, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut. The question of personal rights proved a stumbling block to ratification in other states. 
and the Federalists soon promised to add a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. With the Bill of Rights guaranteed, Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, and New Hampshire ratified. Nine states had approved, and technically, the Constitution was the law of the land. However, Virginia and New York were still undecided, and the Federalists knew that if these two important states remained outside the new Union, the U.S. could not survive. Madison led the debate for ratification in Virginia, where he was opposed by Patrick Henry. However, Madison managed to push through a favorable vote, and Virginia became the 10th ratifying state. Alexander Hamilton led the fight in New York, where he was opposed by New York Governor Clinton. Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay wrote the famous Federalist Papers to win support for the Constitution in New York. Slowly, Hamilton began to sway delegates, and he managed to keep a vote on ratification from taking place until news of Virginia's ratification was received in New York. When Virginia ratified, New Yorkers realized they had no choice but to ratify themselves, and so, reluctantly, New York became the 11th state. Only North Carolina and Rhode Island refused to join the Union and both states remained outside of it until the 1790s. With the Constitution approved, Congress dissolved the Articles of Confederation. As 1788 drew to a close, the first elections under the Constitution were ready to be held, and a new experiment in government was about to be launched. Thank you.